Hi everybody, I'm Don Dixon and I want to welcome you to our very first edition of Ask the Coach. Uh, my wife and I decided to sort of set this up so that we could field some questions uh, from all of our subscribers. And as much as we try, when, when you're teaching, you try to like hit every little thing that you're, you're thinking about on every subject, but there's a lot of uh, misconceptions as you move along. Maybe something wasn't fully understood. And I know that you all have a bunch of questions. So we're going to attempt through doing this, we said originally once a month. But we've decided we'll probably do it twice a month because we've had so many questions coming in. There's no way that we could uh, do a full question and answer with all of them. It would take three, four hours. But I do want to mention to you that as we move next month to doing two question and answer sessions, be sure to send your questions, uh, but make them as comments from the videos. And that way uh, I'll be able to answer those questions uh, in this venue. And as we begin, I just want to say before I get started, I hope I don't melt. We were going to shoot this video tomorrow, except it's supposed to be raining all day long, 100%. And you probably have gathered by now I like to shoot outside. So we come outside here today in the middle of the day, and they said it's only 92 or 94, but it feels like 104. So as long as I don't melt, I'm going to try to answer these questions. I'm going to start off with a question. It comes from Jimmy G. And I thought this was kind of cute because a couple of weeks ago I, I said, you know, we might get a question from some guy in Phoenix and, you know, and I give an answer and it might help you with a question that you had all along from somebody that was asked by somebody you don't even know. Well, I got this question from James G. He said, oh, by the way, I'm the guy from Phoenix. Ha ha. He said, I wanted to ask about thermoclines and if it is something you or Buck ever considered when eliminating water, question mark. He goes on to ask, if there is a 25 foot thermocline in the summer, would you ever fish below that? Okay. Good question. And one of the reasons I put it in is because he's from Phoenix. But I must have had six or eight other fellows ask the same question about thermoclines. Now, thermoclines, for those of you who don't know, it's just the stratification of water as per temperature. And there's a lot said about thermoclines. And I can tell you from being with Buck all of those years, for the entire 35 years of fishing with Buck, he never considered a thermocline one time. Never considered it. Now, if you ask him as a scientist, if you have a, a, a stratification of water where there's two distinct changes in the temperature of the water where they meet, will a fish just penetrate through there? We know, we've, we've said before, a fish won't. He, he can adapt, but he can't adapt quickly. So will he penetrate that? The answer is no, he won't. And that thermocline or that change in temperature creates what we call, and it could be, could be thermal or it could be something else. But anytime you have a difference in water temperature, fish will, rather than penetrate, they'll move along it. It's what Buck referred to as an invisible brake line. It exists. But how often did Buck Perry, I'm just telling you, how often did Buck Perry mention it or worry about it? Answer, never. Now, Buck never paid any mind to it, nor did I, only because I always did what Buck said. And I could tell when he was concerned about something, I always knew. And I made sure that I studied that point real hard. When it came to thermocline or stratification of water, he did not care. He absolutely recognized the possibility, but in his actual fishing, never concerned himself with it. Now, I'll give you one thermocline story that I have. After working for the state of Illinois, I had some questions and some inroads and uh, was uh, asked by the state of Ohio if I could fish one of their lakes. And to, to be honest with you, I cannot remember the name of the lake. It was out, out in the western end of the state a little bit. And they had been doing a project, and they were putting muskie in this lake. And they said they hadn't seen any muskie show up over, I don't know, whatever it was, over a five, six, seven-year period. No one was catching any muskie. 
and could I fish it just to establish if there's any musky there. Now I had done some work on musky and I developed this reputation and we had won the uh, International Musky Tournament so they figured I was the man for the job so I said sure I'm like you know old pal and have money I'll travel. So I went out to Ohio, Western Ohio, to this lake and I was greeted by four conservation officers. They met me at this little restaurant right on the lake. And they wanted to have a little meeting with me before I went out. I said, fine, I'm sitting there having a little breakfast. Talking to these scientists who said, before you go out, I'm go we're going to give you a hint. Don't waste your time below 25 feet. Because there is a distinct thermocline occurring in this lake at a depth of 25 feet this summer. And so you wouldn't be able to catch anything below 25 feet. So don't bother fishing any deeper than that. So at any rate, uh, they paid my breakfast bill and I thanked them. And, and uh, I was going to check with them later in the afternoon. They were going to come back. So when I went out and did my fishing, now Tommy was in another part of the state. He wasn't with me. I was by myself. Uh, so I went out and I think it was within the first two hours. I caught two fish. Both of the fish were right around 18, maybe 20 pounds. I didn't weigh them. And back then, that was before the cell phone thing. I didn't take a picture. I just put them back. And I caught both of those fish at 35 feet water. <laughs> so much for the don't fish below 25 feet. I found my structure and I could read the break lines. I could read the drop off and I went through my same old system I do every time. I ended up fishing that 35 foot break line on a pattern trolling pass. Pow! 18, 20 pound muskie. So, the, that night, I told these guys when we met back up at around dinner time that I caught two fish. And I said, my partner's going to be here tomorrow. I said, he's, he's a real camera guy. I said, we're going to fish it some more. We'll fish it a couple days and we'll make sure we get some pictures. And they said, that would be great. And I think when I told them the story, I don't think they believed me. But I wasn't concerned about a thermocline. I just taken what I have on that structure and fishing it. The next day, Tommy and I caught five muskies in that lake, all trolling, and every fish was below 25 feet. I hope you get my point. So that was the last time I ever even considered a thermocline. Now if I'm in some big old canyon lake out west and it's you know a highland three and it's tough fishing and down in the dam area we have some stratification we actually have a thermocline. I'm heading towards the upper end of the reservoir anyhow. I'm not fishing down there. But if I had a choice and I knew I absolutely proved over and over and over and over and over if I'm doing all of the right things on all my structure and I don't catch a fish, maybe I'll go some other lake. But if you ask Don Dixon how many times I've been affected by, in a negative way, thermocline, never in 45 years. So is it something you worry about? I wouldn't. I sure wouldn't. I didn't then and I wouldn't today. Next question. Doug Schrader. Doug says, I'm from southern Michigan. I fish small 400 to 800 acre natural lakes. Uh, they're rather round and bowl-like. Uh, and most have outside weed lines that are occurring to a depth of 12 to 15 feet. And it comes to maybe two or three feet underneath the surface. And there's only two or three bars in the entire lake. So he goes on to say, I've been fishing the weed lines and the bars. He says, you kind of killed me in your last video when you said that we absolutely should not contour troll in deep water. So he goes on and says, I have three questions for you. First, am I wasting my time trolling or fishing spoon plugs in a small natural lake? Okay, let me answer that one first. No. Two. How do you fish a saddle? I would hit the top, but if it gradually drops off on both sides, do you ever troll the sides? Question mark. The answer is yes, I do. Most of the time. 
your good brake lines will be somewhere on the side. The top, you have to get a really good movement of fish to get those fish up there on top. But many times, if you have little brake lines uh, breaking off the side, whether it's in the upstream side or the downstream or whichever, wherever the deepest water is, uh, like my saddle up in Canada, all of the business is on the brake lines on the sides of the saddle as it's breaking into the deep water. Not up on top. That's like saying if I have a hump, do I catch most of my fish on top? No. Occasionally I catch a few up there when the activity is really great. Most of the time they're at some deeper break off of that hump. Same with a saddle. It's all a saddle is. It's an underwater hump. But it only has deep water on two sides. So the answer to number two is you have to establish. Now he prefaced that second question by saying it just gradually slopes. Are you sure? Because people that fish in Florida lakes, they say there's no break lines, it just slopes. Because keep in mind, what I'm fishing here in Florida is what you're fishing. Some of my lakes are bigger, but there are natural glacier lakes like you're fishing. The Great Lakes are just natural glacier lakes formed by the glacier, and they're just bowls. Many times, we just had a, a, a video not too long ago where I showed fishing and catching smallmouth in Lake Erie. It was on a reef. By the way, I saw something not too long ago. Guys have circled these humps in Lake Erie and calling them reefs. They're not reefs, they're humps. A reef is where you have a rock outcropping, just like this mat would be the rock outcropping on the bottom of the lake. Now, because Lake Erie, where I was fishing, goes like this. It just slopes. But I'm in this area of this reef as it's sloping 40 feet flat, 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 and pretty soon you're in 45 feet, but you never saw it break anywhere. It just got deeper and deeper. You went a half a mile, and finally you're in 45 feet. But at 45 feet that day, I saw it break two feet, 45 to 47. Now in Lake Erie, uh, ocean, you wouldn't think, what does that mean? A little two foot break. Meant the difference between catching no fish and 200 fish that day. That's the difference it made, fishing that break line. So I'm telling you, uh, Doug, I'm pretty sure if I was up there fishing with you and got on that saddle and took my time to cross over the top of that saddle and off the side and watch my depth sider very closely, somewhere there's probably a little break, and that's where you're going to find your fish. But if, in fact, it just does slope and there is no break, I find another lake. If you can't find any feature to fish deeper than 10 feet, keep in mind. I said don't, con don't contour troll in deep water. I said when you get to 10 feet or deeper, we have to have a feature that we're trying to hit. Not just fishing out there in deep water somewhere. That doesn't get it. Excuse me, that's a real needle in a haystack. We need to find structure breaks and break lines. Sometimes, in your kind of lake that you're talking about, sometimes it'll just be a foot or two break line. That's all I have in Florida. I'm fishing one foot break lines. I mentioned not too long ago, there's one lake, probably the best bass lake I ever fished. I was catching them on three different break lines and each break line was six inches. Buck couldn't even believe that I was finding these fish on a six inch drop off. When I showed it to him, we took him fishing showed you a picture the other day, the hog stringer all came from a six inch break line. So somebody said to me, how's that even possible? Well, think about it. That's like a curb coming off a sidewalk to the street. It's a curb. That looks like a mountain to a fish. They have no problem seeing that. The problem comes in is most of us fishermen, we're not either good enough or we're not careful enough. We're not precise enough in our mapping to discover that little subtle break and there's all the fish. So I'm going to encourage you, keep fishing that stuff. And then you also mentioned that you are fishing the weed lines. Make sure you're fishing the weed lines properly. And I'm going to touch on that. I have another question. I'm going to touch on that. And I can see that Doug definitely has a sense of humor as well because he writes for question number three. He said, if the answer to question number one, which, mind you, was, is he wasting his time trolling spoon plugs in a small natural lake? He said, if the answer to question number one is yes, 
Do you know anyone looking for a new boat, tiller motor, two new trolling rods and reels, and 25 new spoon plugs? LOL. <laughs> I love this guy already. But trust me, there's always something there. And if there isn't something there, you got to go find you another lake. If you're really precise and really searching, and there just isn't anything there, you got the weed line and that's it. You're fishing 10 to 12 feet and you're done. You, you, you can't find anything else to fish. Go find another lake. That's my best advice. And thanks for the question, Doug. I appreciate you, buddy. Next, we have a question from Randy Compton. He said, why in the world do you start in the shallows and then go to deep water? Why not start at the closest break line to the channel? Because my map shows distinct lines at 70, 50, 30, and so on and so forth, all the way up to the bank. Let's get right to the number one question there. Why do we start fishing in the shallows? I made a comment way back when we started vlogging five, six months ago. You must first understand above and beyond all things that fish are somewhere in the lake. They're not up in the woods somewhere. They're in the lake. They're in the shallows. They're in the deep water. Or they're somewhere in between. Now, I start all of my talk same way. They're somewhere in the lake, guys. Let's not pretend like the day we don't catch any fish, we'll say, well, man, I don't know. I don't think there's any fish in that lake. Oh, yeah, there is. But how could you actually say that unless you fished all the shallows, all the in-between water, and all the deep water? How could you make that statement? All, all most people know today is they weren't in the shallows. They fished there all day, didn't catch any, so they deduce. They're not there. Oh, yeah, they are. They're just not the area of the water that they were fishing. So why do I start shallows versus starting deep when we know most of the time they're deep? Here's the reason. When fish are in deep water, they're very dormant. They're non-chasing. They're very slow. They won't chase a bait. Now they can become active in deep water and then that changes things. But 95% of that day, they're not active. So if I start in deep water, I could be fishing right where the fish are and still not catching. Conversely, when the fish become active and move, when they're up towards the shallows, the water's warmer. They're more active. Don't forget, they're cold-blooded creatures. The warmer the water, the more active they are. They're swimming, they're feeding, they're eating. They're chasing the lures, they're going nuts. And many times when that school of fish gets to a depth of 15, 17 feet, they're active, they're going nuts. So why in the world would I want to do a great mapping job, find the end of the bar out here, breaking at 45 feet into 60, and anchor down my boat and go to fishing a plastic worm real slow, just trying to coax a fish down there to hit? Why would I be doing that if all the fish are up at 14 feet just going nuts, just waiting, for, you know, where you can catch 30 fish in 30 minutes? I'm never going to assume. Buck always said, don't ever assume. We know what the, what the traditional, what the percentages say and all of that, but don't assume there's no good fish in the shallows. Go check the shallows. If they're there, you're going to catch them because they're active or they wouldn't be there. And then I'm going to check the in-between water where I can read my structure, 14 feet, 17 feet, whatever the feature is. I want to fish that in-between water next because they're there. They're active or they wouldn't be there. And I'm going to end up at the deepest stuff because they could not maybe not be active but sort of catchable I don't know how many big old walleyes we caught up in 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 the summer schools where there really wasn't an activity period but over a course of two three hours you catch 10 or 12 big fish downstairs by being precise so we end up there but we don't start there that makes no sense I want to start up here. If they're here, they're really active. If they're in here, they're really active. And I don't want to miss them while I'm feeling around out here trying to coax one fish to hit a little plastic worm. So that's the reason we start in the shallows. All right. We're coming to Michael Wagner. His home lake in Minneapolis area has submerged weed lines. This is a question that's asked by at least a dozen people. He says, uh, this is in Minneapolis area. It has submerged weed lines out to about 10 feet of water. The weeds come up to a few feet below the surface. Any advice how to contour troll the shallows in these conditions? Yes, I have advice. 
Understand first that in a natural lake, Glacier Lake, and I had a great story I could tell you about going to Minneapolis and running a four-day on water school for some guys up there who were really good students. They wanted me to come and show them how to tackle four different lakes that they would choose in the Minneapolis area. This was way back sometime in the late 80s, I think. And they all had weed lines like, like Michael just suggested. And I said, before we even look at contour maps, because they had contour maps, I said, follow me, and I'm going to show you how we can figure this lake out without a map, just by using a weed line. So I had them trickle in behind me. We had a total of five, counting my boat, we had five boats. And I had them follow close behind me as I trolled the weed line. I had two guys in the boat with me. I allowed them to fish while I was following the weed line. Now, in a natural lake, the weeds will grow always to the same depth. It's not like in some other fishing situations, but in a natural lake, if you have a weed line to 10 feet down on the south end, when you go to the north end of that lake, your weed line is at 10 feet. It's always the same. So in the case of trying to contour troll a weed line, I've got to follow along the edge because in a lake where you have a solid weed line, like we're talking about, that becomes the new scatter point for the fish. That's where the big fish put on the brakes. If they get that far, that's where they put on the brakes. They're not going any further. So the outside edge of that weed line can be very, very productive at times. But if nothing else, if the fish stop at 15, there'll be plenty of fish to get up to the edge of that weed line. So we want to be fishing the outer edge of that weed line. That's our new break line. That's our new shoreline. I'm not going to troll in the weeds, but I'm going to troll the outer edge of the weeds. And how do I do it? Well, if I already know, you have uh, 10 to 12 feet. Let's say that you, you said in your lake it's 12 feet deep. That means all around the lake your weed line's at 12 feet. So I'm going to set my meter down there at 12 feet knowing that that's where my weed line goes. And it grows to a depth of 12 feet. So am I going to start fishing at 12 feet? No. Remember when fish are in the shallows, they'll take a lure on top, somewhere in the intermediate water, and off the bottom. So I've got to strain all of the water, 8 to 10 feet. If my weed line stops me, that's where I start, but I start with a 500 spoon plug. I cannot tell you how many thousands of fish I caught on a 500 spoon plug trying to work out a lake just following a 10 foot or a 12 foot weed line just falling on the outer edge of that weed line and ticking that little 500, ticking the weeds a little bit here and there, bang, catch fish. How did that fish get there? He followed something and directed me to an area of the lake where I ended up finding a big fish. Thousands of times. Can't tell you how many times. So keep this in mind. Your weed line is your new shoreline. But I got a fish two to four feet, four to six, six to nine, I got to fish all of those depths to say I've checked my shallows. I'm just doing it on the outside of the weed line. So how do I keep my lures from getting in the weeds all the time? I practice trolling. And don't forget, if they're growing at 10 feet, they're growing at 10 feet all the way around the lake. So if I'm 10 feet, turn out a little bit, turn back in, tick and turn out a little bit, it gets deeper, turn back in. I'm going to try to sort of contour with a 500, 400, and 250 what I normally would be doing by feel, but now I'm using my depth sounder to help me because my knowledge of a lake type tells me my weeds are growing to the same depth. So I'm going to set my focus on 10 feet and go through the lures. If my weed line is 15 feet, I'm going all the way down to the base of those weeds. My last pass be made with a 100. And by then, you find some good structure anyhow. Go back real quick and just finish up that story. Never forget the guy's name was Jerry Perano, not only a great student, but it turned out to be a great friend. Minneapolis, St. Paul. He and a bunch of his buddies, they picked these lakes. The only one I can remember the name is White Bear. Uh, you know, they were all about the same. Not very big, not real big. All had weed lines. And we would not hit that first one, fall the weed line all the way around the lake. When we got back to the truck, we had caught somewhere around 60 or 70 fish. Just trolling the weed line. Northern Pike, smallmouth, and largemouth. And when we got back to the truck, we got the map out, and we circled every spot that we had already found without looking at the map. 
we had every spot on that lake we found by trolling the weed line. And then we'd mark it down and say what it was, get shoreline sightings. We had it all except one hump. And if we would have taken the time to do a detailed map of a certain bar, we would have found the hump. You can work out a whole lake and catch a whole bunch of fish just by trolling the edge, outer edge of the weed line. But you got to do it smartly. You have to establish where do my weeds grow to? 10 feet, 12 feet, 14 feet, whatever the number is. Set your depth signer and go. But run through your lures, fishing the complete face of those weeds. You'll be amazed how many fish you catch. So that's your answer on that one. Okay, let's move on. Let me see, Rob and Diane. Oh, great, we're gonna show a picture. Rob sent me a picture of uh, himself and his daughter on one of those deep, clear, canyon-type lakes. And it's the cutest thinking picture. I'm gonna throw it up right here. And after just talking about how the kids are so important to me, and all you gotta do is look at that little girl's face. Now, she loves being with her daddy. You can tell that, for starters. But she's just pretty proud of herself. She, she has a fish. And when you're catching fish, it's fun. So Rob's written me a couple of questions, a couple other things we'll talk about later. But in this particular one, he writes, one thing I'm struggling with is in Buck's advanced material, he talks about at times a break line can change in depth as it goes around the bar. If I have a break line at 25 to 27 feet, let's say, and it goes for a ways around this big bar and then flattens out, at 25 and starts to break maybe out at 28 to 30. He said, and I'm watching my depth sounder. He said, I'm stuck here on this 25 foot and in reality what I'm doing is I'm starting to just cruise across this 25 foot flat. He says, goes on to say, I know it's my lack of experience, but how exactly do you handle this concern? Now that's a good one. And I've got some illustrations I'm gonna use when we get into talking about casting. But this is uh, something that happens all the time. And most of the time, it, that break line is not getting deeper, it's getting shallower. <laughs> but at any rate, his example was, it was well taken. I understand what he means. And here's the key. I didn't show enough. We'll be talking more about running break lines and stuff. Uh, but we have to establish when we're running a break line that it's still breaking. It's still going. The only way to do that is to be angling your boat out. When you see it still on it, you instantly angle it back. And if you make that quick move, you didn't go three or four feet with your boat, but your lure hasn't changed this much. So the trick is you want to keep seeing it breaking. Otherwise, you could be going out over a flat. Keep seeing it breaking. But at the same time, once it does start to break, instantly angle the boat back in. And as soon as you see that needle, or in my case, needle and whatever graph you're using, when you see that, in this case, 25 feet solid again, you're angling back out again. And you must establish it's still breaking. Now, what will happen most of the time, one of these examples I'm going to use uh, when we talk about casting creates what Buck calls the perfect structure. He actually referred to it as this is the perfect structure. Following a break line around at 25, breaking at 27, all of a sudden it goes 25, 30, boom, or 35, pow. And you can't turn a boat quick enough. In other words, it's made a turn, probably the end of the bar. And you start following. It was breaking 25 to 30. All of a sudden it went from 25 to 35. And you couldn't, you kept turning a boat, but it kept deep. It's still deep, 35, 34, 30. And you had to go almost like this to get back to see your 25. And then you're turning back out like you were before, but now you're heading towards the shoreline. And you, you want to see it break off, so you see it break off, you turn back in. Pretty soon, when it comes back up, it doesn't come to 25 and stop. It comes from, from 30 feet or 35 feet. It'll come up, and it goes right by 25 feet up to 22. And then it pauses, and then it stops. Well, now my brake line's breaking at 22 feet. So now I see it steady at 22, I'm turning back off, and it starts to go right away, I'm turning back in. Go another 20 yards, and all of a sudden when I turn back to my 22, it comes up to 17. Doesn't stop. 30 feet, and as I turn back in, it comes right by 25, 22, 20, 17, and then pauses at 17. Now my brake line is at 17 feet, breaking to 30. So what's happening is the same brake line Breaking out here, 25 to 30. 
25 to 30. 25 to 35. Turn the boat still. 30, 30, 25. Turn back out. 35. Turn back in. 22. Turn back out. 32. Turn back in. Doesn't stop till it gets to 20. You see what's going on? That brake line is going uphill towards the shoreline. Out here it's breaking, breaking, breaking. Breaks off the end. It's all still deep. But this thing, like at most every land formation in the world, goes like this from the shoreline to here. So this brake line still exists. Same brake line, but a different depth. Up here it's 17 to 30. Here it's 20 to 32. Here it's 25 to 35. Here it's 27 to 40. Same break. So how do you answer this question specifically? How do I follow that? By turning off until you see it start to go. When it starts to go, you angle back in. And you keep angling back in until you see your depth sounder stop. When it stops, you angle back out until you see it break. Once it breaks, you angle back in. You keep coming back in until it stops. And sometimes that depth will be different. It just keeps getting shallow. And that's what Buck calls a perfect structure. Here's a contact point. They just keep coming right up that brake line. Same brake line. Coming right up to you. I got a great story I'm going to share with you next time we get together on casting. Showing that exact same thing. So, all right. That being stated, I hope you got that one, Rob. And thanks for the picture, my friend. Rob kind of looks like a study. He's a good-looking guy. But man, that daughter stole that picture. I'm sure everybody out here will agree with me on that one, Rob. <laughs> At any rate, thanks for sharing that picture. And I want more and more of you out there when you send questions. Something I'm going to use. Send me a fish picture, a good one. I think, yeah, that was the last question I wrote down. And it's really hot. And I haven't quite melted, but I've come close. <laughs> but I want you to continue to send your questions. And next time we get together... Those two times that we do it next month, we'll have quite a few more questions we'll be able to get answered. And in the end, it's really what I want to do. So, it was a good session. And with all that being said, I want to encourage you to uh, follow us on Instagram and like us on Facebook. And be sure to subscribe to our channel. We appreciate you. appreciate all your questions. And we'll see you the next time.